Today, we're going to do something a little different. I usually interview writers, directors, producers, people making stories, telling stories, and portraying characters. Today's going to be the first time we feature a documentary, and a very important documentary. It's a powerful documentary called Wild Cat. The film focuses on Harry Turner, my guest's very real life, and his complex journey. He enlisted in the military at just 18 years old, and a traumatic tour of duty in Afghanistan left him struggling with PTSD and severe recurrent depression. Although a trip to South America temporarily relieved his suffering, he relapsed after returning home to England. Life, as he says in the film, was not worth living. After a failed suicide attempt, he decided to go to Peru with a vague plan to end his life there. The film showcases the unlikely bond between Harry and the baby Ocelot. As a veteran devoted himself to preparing the small cat to become self-sufficient out in the wild, in turn, it helped Harry prepare himself to return to the real world. Though I'm not quite sure he realizes that in real time, and it's quite a raw and beautiful narrative that the filmmakers masterfully assemble throughout the film. When Harry looked to disappear into the wilderness, he had a chance encounter with conservationist Samantha Zwicker. She offered him a second chance. Samantha and Harry rescue a one-month-old ocelot from the black market, and together they decide to reintroduce the cat into the wild. Falling in love with both the kitten and Samantha, Harry agrees to become the adoptive mother of the ocelot and spend the next 18 months in a remote compound deep in the jungle, devoting himself entirely to the cat. From bottle feeding to the cat's first successful rodent hunt, Harry celebrates their milestones. But Harry must wrestle with his own demons if he and the cat are going to survive. What's so unique about this experience for me, as someone who found out about the film, watched it, and then had a chance to interview one of the people within it, a real life story, is that there is this story that is so beautifully assembled to create such an important film. And within that film... There are countless stories that are critical to all of us right now. And I'm so used to these stories being fiction and interviewing somebody about how they got into a role, but this is someone's life. And this is a candid, authentic look at one person's approach to living with, you know, PTSD and depression. For someone to want to share that with the world is remarkable to me. And by the way, he filmed a lot of the actual footage used in the documentary himself So to be a willing participant and a camera operator at the same time is unbelievable. During my research, I came across this quote from one of the filmmakers, and it sat with me for quite some time. We had to depend on Harry to keep filming while we were away and to turn the camera on some really fragile moments in his life, says Melissa Lesh, one of the directors. We initially thought that would be one of our biggest challenges, but we eventually realized it was one of the project's greatest strengths. Turner recorded about one-third of the footage used in the film, filming his encounters with the cat, from his introduction, through his efforts to return it to the wild. He teaches the animal what to eat, encourages him to climb the forest canopy, and how to avoid the many perils of living in the Amazon. The filmmaker said, those scenes capture what we never could have. He was alone in the forest, and the camera became his companion during periods of isolation and away from him to talk to us when we weren't there. It helped us go deeper. Harry's video diary captures some of the most intimate moments where they are romantic interludes with Zwicker, his depression, when the cat disappears, an onslaught of insects, or the inevitable stomach bugs. One of the producers, Josh Altman, said, The jungle is always finding new ways to kill you. Harry was terribly sick during some of the filming, but he kept going. He got badly burned by battery acid, had at least 12 bot flies embedded in his back, but he never forgot his mission was protecting the ocelot. Despite those difficulties, Harry's dedication to the ocelot gave him a reason to get up every day, believes the other director, Trevor Frost. Having something or someone to take care of is so important. We are biologically hardwired with the need for a sense of purpose, but depression and PTSD can make it seem impossible to find. Harry was able to escape from a certain type of reality because he had to be fully committed every day to the cat. Despite Harry's devotion to the process, however, there was no way to predict the outcome of what was essentially an experiment. One filmmaker said, We didn't know what would happen or how it would transform over the period of the shoot, Lesh explains. Trying to put an animal back into natural habitat is cutting edge, and as habitats change and we lose more species, it becomes even more important. The element that really sets this film apart is its honest presentation of mental illness. 
A lot of scripted movies end with a complete resolution, but that's not the reality, co-director Frost said. Anyone who's struggling with trauma or mental illness can tell you it's a journey that will likely last a lifetime. But I do think with the right help, you can learn to reframe your relationship with what you struggle with and even find positive aspects of it. Harry and Sam interact with the world in a unique way because of the way they experienced it, not despite it. In Wildcat, we witness in real time the difficulty of wildlife conservation work and also the reasons why it must be pursued. At the same time, the inner journeys of Samantha and Harry speak to the pains of letting go, the challenges of living with trauma, coming of age, and contributing to something larger than ourselves. We learn from Harry and Samantha that what we struggle with does not define us, and that despite our struggles, we can still achieve the extraordinary. The filmmakers are hopeful that watching the film will inspire viewers to take action on the issues that are important to them. Many of us want the chance to do something good in the world, but it can be scary to take the opportunity when it comes around. Frost says, I hope people will see how Harry and Sam created the chance to do something good when no one else would. You can do extraordinary things when you put your mind to it. Personally, I think Wildcat might just be the most important film of the year. This was the hardest interview I've ever done. I'm used to interviewing people who create worlds, write stories, and play characters. Having the opportunity to interview someone as brave as Harry, who is not only sharing his very real life and these vulnerable experiences for the world to see in the most raw way, but he's also willing to do interviews, to talk through those experiences, reflect on those painful memories, and share with us more of that journey. All in hopes to make the world a better place and perhaps impact just one person's life. I really hope this film impacts many. I hope it starts conversations, and I hope those conversations don't stop. Harry, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Yourself? Doing well. Uh, where are you today? Uh, currently in the UK. Um, I came here for a screening in London, which uh, went really well, actually. And then I did a, a screening um, in uh, Essex, where my family's from, and so my friends and family got to, to see that as well, and that was really good, you know, kind of nerve-wracking, because some of my family and friends hadn't seen it before, so pretty nerve-wracking, but, you know, now I'm kind of in limbo, I'm, I'm figuring out my visa to get back to the US, um, but I'm almost there, so I'll hopefully be back in the US uh, in, in no time. We'll, we'll see. Well, we can't wait to have you here. Um, you, you know, since you brought it up, I was curious as you're seeing your this was a extraordinary film first and foremost i i didn't know what to expect from the trailer i didn't know expect uh going into it and it took me for a extremely emotional powerful ride that uh i was honestly this is i've interviewed hundreds of people and this is probably the most inner most nervous i have been going into an interview because it's such a powerful story and it's your story it's not um it's not an actor playing a role. This is you sharing, you know, your heart and soul with the world in the most vulnerable way. When you go to a screening and you see your friends and family see it, what's that what's that experience like for you? You know, for them going into the theater, um, I'm shaking like a leaf in the wind. It's, you know, I'm so nervous because I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want people to try and you know, feel guilty or, or anything afterwards, you know, and, and I'm just kind of, you know, extremely nervous about their reactions. But afterwards, um, you know, I always know that people are going to, they're going to be on a roller coaster, that's for sure, but they're always going to come out um, at the end of the film kind of knowing that, you know, I'm still alive, I'm still kind of fighting and doing the things I love and um, I'm, you know, they and uh, I can talk to them and so... As they go in, I'm very nervous, but as they come out, I know that, you know, they're only going to have great things to say. And it is, it is kind of a surreal thing to show them kind of my life story in an hour and 45 minute film that has been beautifully put together with music and, um, you know, just to show them all of the cinematography and filming that, you know, I had put into it as well. It's just, you know, uh, it makes me feel a little bit proud. You have to be. And, um, you know, you, you touch on a lot of things that I had after I saw it, I sat there for like a minute processing my feelings. And then, then I started thinking from a production standpoint, I'm like, wait a minute, the filmmakers couldn't have gotten into the story early on. They had to have come in in the middle. So I watched it again, trying to figure out like there had to have been a point where this is a story that you're capturing. And then there was this element of when the filmmakers came in and kind of 
picked up and I was trying to watch it where it happened. So how did it even come about? Yeah, so I started filming by myself because I had this passion, you know, I was walking in the jungles with this incredible and beautiful animal and was just kind of like swept away by all of this. You know, I didn't know anyone who had come out of the military, gone to the jungle and was walking barefoot in the jungle of an ocelot. You know, I was just capturing these moments just for memories. Um, and I was like, no, I want to be able to like show people in the future and show them kind of like clips. So I just kept recording, you know, just bits by bits. You know, it wasn't really like I was filming for a documentary. I was just filming for fun. Um, and then uh, obviously you see um, that there's some tragedy that happens with Khan and uh, that breaks me. And so I kind of stop recording, stop being in Peru. I go to Australia, you know, I go back to England to see my family. I'm, uh, you know, extremely hurt and um, lost, you know, extremely lost. Uh, but something kind of is inside me saying, you got to go back to Peru, like you have to go back. And so I went back and I was there for about six months and my visa was up and I was getting ready to get on a plane um, and uh, I bump into Trevor and Melissa. Well, I bumped into Trevor, and uh, I had, had a, a phone call with Melissa from with Trevor, and um, he was out doing a National Geographic kind of um, photo shoot with anacondas, and he was trying to, you know, get some photos of anacondas for his story. And uh, I think he was there for almost two or three months, and he had only come across like one or two baby mm -hmm. anacondas, and it just kind of wasn't going where it wanted to and so um a mutual friend of ours kind of put us in touch and i showed him some stuff that i'd captured on on the hard drive and he was like wow like this is incredible like i'd love to make a short documentary on it if that's okay uh and then about a month after that is when keanu came into the mix and you know after that he brought down all the camera equipment sound you know audio everything i needed silica you know dry bags dry cases and then from there i filmed for a whole you know year and a half just constantly camera in hand out at night um i was illegal in peru for close to 570 days um because i couldn't leave the ocelot and so i was in the jungle just non-stop constantly filming things breaking and um you know backing up hard drive after hard drive wow that's extraordinary i mean at, at some point i was as i was watching i'm like there's i don't think there can be a camera crew with this ex the experience you're having with the with Keanu, right? Like, I don't think it has to just be you, correct? Yeah, so for the reintroduction, um, it was said that nobody was gonna have an interaction with him other than me. Um, filming was gonna be done by myself because you want it to be natural. And he had been brought up with me, you know, originally when we first got him, he slept on my chest and uh, you know, I fed him and, you know, deparasited him and we'd go on walks. And so he was used to me and I, and used to the camera as well. And so I basically said like, it's not going to be possible for you guys to film him. Um, and, and so that's when we kind of like had to sit down and be like, this is what we need filmed. And I was like, okay, you know, and I had kind of like a checklist and I just went out and filmed everything that I could. Um, we actually filmed over a thousand wow. hours of footage um, and we managed to get that down to an hour and 45 minutes. I can't imagine what that was like. I mean, just the, I had a note here about your nighttime walks and as you know, you, you talk about them, but I'm like, I don't think it's, you know, we understand what a nighttime walk with an ocelot is like in the rainforest or, you know, in, in the Amazon. What is that? What does that entail? Yeah. So ocelots are nocturnal. Um, they can be seen during the day and they will depend on how hungry they are but like predominantly they're nocturnal so um at night time i would always go out i would take my cam camera equipment um i had a sony handycam which actually had a nocturnal um kind of switch on it um so that was really good for filming if he was kind of close um and i would go out for uh, three four five, six, seven hours, you know, depending on, on where we went or depending on kind of like what was going on and uh, just go from there. You know, every, every night was completely different. We might find a snake. We might bump into a tapir. There was a few times where we bumped into other cats um, and, you know, the, the danger for him was always about 
um, a lot of people are always kind of asking me like how dangerous is the jungle and, and what is the biggest threat that you see and the the answer to that is humans um, humans are the biggest danger that you'll ever come into contact with in a natural place um, even though there's venomous snakes even though there's jags which are big enough to kind of crush a skull they will leave you alone if you don't interfere with them and so for me the the night walks were always terrifying when I either saw light heard voices you know or or heard gunshots and sometimes you could hear the gunshots from across the the river um on uh different parts of land and so you know them their moments were the most petrifying to me yeah i can't imagine i mean i think that in the beginning you talk about going to the jungle and uh i was curious what what did the jungle attract to you when you when you were you were, were you in essex before you left yeah, so um, growing up, um, I kind of moved all all over the place. My dad was in the navy, so mm-hmm. in you know a few years we lived in many houses, and so um, I had always grown up kind of like loving animals. We'd always had dogs growing up, and uh, with my granddad, um, I always used to watch kind of like nature documentaries, and it was it was just this really kind of like cool intimate thing that I had with my granddad. Uh, he would kind of record them on VHS and then I'd go around there and, and uh, we would watch them together about like Ko- Komodo dragons and, you know, just crazy kind of things that I never, ever thought that I would be able to get to see in my life. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it just, I, I was in Essex after the military. I has always had a love for reptiles and amphibians. I did basically a quick Google search of volunteering in the Amazon. Um, and so I found this place called Fauna Forever, which is in the Peruvian Amazon. And when I went out there, uh, I, I volunteered for a month. And um, I kind of went out there with the intention of not coming back. Um, I was in quite a bad place mentally. And uh, when I was out there, I, it was about day 14 where I had this kind of epiphany. And I was like, right, okay, you need to live. Like there's something that's, you know, that you need to have you have to be alive for you have family you have friends you have all these things that you should be able to live for like you need to kind of get in a better headspace and uh yeah that's kind of just how i ended up in the jungle uh i've always had a love for animals and while struggling with depression i needed to escape and i just did a quick google search and landed myself in the peruvian amazon what in the jungle kind of reinforced this idea to keep going like what is it what happened like what was the what was the the incident or the moment do you recall that said like oh this is i gotta keep going i gotta keep fighting i was fishing and i was coming back on the boat with dinner and uh the the sun was going down and the birds were changing with the bats and i just was sat on the front of the boat with the wind blowing in my face and i just had this kind of like I don't know, it was kind of like the weight was lifted off my shoulders. And I had been in the jungle for two weeks at the time. And it's, you know, scientifically proven that being submerged in nature uh, has a great impact on mental health. And so I guess that's what happened, you know, like my mental health, I had this so much stress and so much anger and hate and depression on my shoulders that when I kind of forgot about it all, it was just all let go. It's kind of like I had just took the biggest breath in and in my life. But then being out in the jungle, it was, I didn't have the worry of money. I didn't really have the worry of being in a job I didn't like. I was just, you know, living in the jungle and it was just easy. And so I guess um, just living that kind of like free lifestyle, that kind of like nomadic lifestyle just gave me the kind of like a uh, boost that I needed. And then when you incorporate the animals, these animals were young, very young, like two to three weeks old when they were first found, sick. Uh, They needed a mother. And so I needed to be better in myself so that I could be there for them. And them being in need made me a stronger person. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, Your your soul is uh, extraordinary. And I love seeing your journey from what I can experience. And I can't imagine... When you watch it, it's almost like playing back memories. It's got to your point earlier. You said it was surreal, right? Have you have you watched it recently? Do when the premieres? Do you go into the premieres and actually watch them every time? I don't watch them. Um, it's too much of a trigger for me. I you know 
have lived through it once. I don't need to live through it all again. Um, and I think the great thing about filmmaking is that you can make it feel like you're actually in it again. And so for me, it's, uh, it's quite triggering. Um, and so I don't, I usually watch the first kind of like five minutes. Um, I love the bit where Keanu kind of runs after the squirrel um, and the end bit, you know, where I'm kind of off in Ecuador and I'm pursuing what I want to do with the rest of my life. When you reflect mentally on that experience, the timeline of Wildcat, what is something that you're extremely grateful for for that period of time? I'm extremely grateful that I managed to capture so much footage. Um, not only for the film, like Wildcat uh, has a lot of footage that I filmed, and I'm you know very proud of that. But just to be able to have that as like a keepsake. Yeah, I can imagine. When you when you watch your friends and family go see this, when you hear about people going to see this, other veterans around the world seeing this, what is it that you hope they take away from this this story? I hope that they don't get triggered. Um, that's one of my main worries is that people might go into it and uh, get upset. Um, not just crying emotionally, but upset like so deeply that it, it triggers them and causes them you know, a deeper pain. But I think that the thing I want people to take away from it most is to know that you're not alone, um, to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and even when you're struggling and you're in the darkest place, it's, it's um it's happening for some weird reason you know like you're gonna come out a bit stronger and better person um and also just to know that there's there's support around um even if you feel like you're alone like that's what depression does to you it kind of like um it kind of makes you feel alone in this world and and that can be terrifying sometimes how old were you when you joined the military Uh, i was 18. when you talk to combat veterans their experiences are extremely unique and very complex. Uh, when you talk to those folks, what do you try to convey to them? I hope that these people that watch it and and uh, who I can speak to afterwards potentially are doing okay. I hope that they um, are just uh, working on themselves. Um, you know, they, they've done a lot in their lives and so they deserve to give themselves some time and they deserve to give themselves a break. Um, and kind of going off of that, um, I've just recently started my own nonprofit called Emerald Arch. And Emerald Arch is an organization which is a US based nonprofit We're based out of Washington State. And that is um, our, our main project that I'm going to be working on over the next few years um, is actually um, raising funds and, and, and buying land in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, as you see at the end of the film, Ecuador is kind of where I left off and it's where I still am. Uh, and then funds are going to be not just to protect the land and to protect the, the wildlife and do scientific research, but it's going to be a, a place where veterans and people struggling with PTSD can go to the jungle and they can kind of walk the road that I did. Um, and, you know, it took me 14 days to realize that my life was worth living. And so if it took me 14 days, why can't it, you know, help other people? And uh, and so I'm hoping that in the next few months with fundraising, we can raise enough to, to buy an incredible bit of land. And then from there on, I'm going to be doing uh, PTSD retreats for veterans so that then they can have an opportunity to, to reset and to start their life on it on a fresh page. Wow, that's extraordinary. Congratulations. You got to be really proud about that. It's it's been uh, a thing I've wanted to do for a very long time. Um, now is definitely a way of making sure that that plan that I've had in my head comes to real life. What is success for you after year one? What is it that you hope to achieve? Success to me is um, is doing what is right. Uh, success doesn't matter about money because at the end of the day, when you die, are you going to die with a lot of money, but no success? Like it, it doesn't really sit well with me. Success is doing something which, uh, is good and is right. And is not just good for you, but good for everything around you, whether that be the people around you or whether that be the environment. Um, and so Emerald Arch is, is going to be this thing where I, um, I put my heart and my soul into it because I know that it's something that I'm going to be doing for the greater good, not just for veterans, because I know 22 veterans a day in the U S alone kill themselves from, uh, you know, depression and, and, uh, substance abuse, but 
you know, if I can save one person, then that's success. Amazing. You um, have a lot of tattoos. Do you have a Do you have a favorite? I think that my favorites are either Khan, which is on my throat, or the Keanu one, which goes down my back. Um, since the film, I have actually got a lot more. Uh, my whole back is covered now. Um, all of my left arm, left armpit, left leg has got only a little bit of space, and the right leg has only got a little bit of space as well. So um, I'm pretty heavily tattooed, but Khan and Keanu are, are definitely my favorites. Well, you, I love the 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 Keanu on the back that was beautiful do you um do you go to the same person for all your tattoos or do you travel and have them done by different people I have my same group of people um but yeah I kind of go between them and you know whoever's free or wherever I am and and uh kind of just stick with the people that I I love and know honestly yeah no it's a special thing um one of the things in this podcast at the very end, we always talk about comfort food. It's the thing I ask every guest. And uh, as a way I describe it is when you're having a bad day and uh, you think of a meal that can make it slightly better, what comes to mind for you? Wow. Uh, damn, that's a hard one. You know, I love French fries. And so, like, it's it's such it's such a British thing. Like, the British have like a they have chip butties. So basically, you have French fries in bread, and uh, it's just like a, a fry sandwich. And uh, that's ba- I, I I could literally live on potatoes. So yeah, um, probably just some French fries and some bread rolls. That's about. Is there a sauce? Uh, I, I usually put some salt and add a little bit of ketchup, but um, usually you just smother it in butter and then the butter melts with the temperature of the fries. And that's that's pretty good. Not very good for cholesterol, <laughs> but it's uh, it's definitely a comfort thing. Well, when you're working as much as you are and you're, you're traveling through the forest, I'm sure it's a good, it's good for your body. Does the bread need to be toasted? I'm curious. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about this. It's um, it's It's the best film I've seen in years. Uh, it's an extraordinary story, and I'm so grateful that there's someone like you who is brave enough to share this experience with the world. And then today, oh, I'm going to do some press. I'm going to go keep talking about this over and over again, which is a very difficult thing to do. So thank you for all that you've shared with the world and continue to do. And I can't wait for Emerald Arch to be available and share that story, too. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Incredible work, Harry. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for checking out this episode. It was very special to me, and it means a lot that you listened to it. Wildcat is out now and currently available on Amazon Prime Video. You can learn more about Harry's new project, Emerald Arch, at emeraldarch.org. We should all be more aware of mental health, and it should be part of our conversation. Please take the time to research suicide awareness and prevention. There's so many resources available to you, your friends, your family, and to those in your community. Thank you. Follow your dreams, no matter where they take you.